Mark Hurd is Chief Executive Officer of Oracle Corporation and a member of the company's board of directors. He joined Oracle in 2010, bringing more than 30 years of technology industry leadership, computer hardware expertise, and executive management experience to his role with the company. Hurd is also a member of the Baylor University Board of Regents. Mark Hurd oversees the corporate direction and strategy for Oracle's global field operations, including sales, support, consulting, marketing, and alliances and channels. He focuses on strategy, leadership, innovation, and customers. Before joining Oracle, Mark Hurd served as the chairman of the board, chief executive officer, and president of HP, where his focus on customers, innovation, operational efficiency, and execution led to significant company growth. Prior to that, he spent 25 years at NCR Corporation, where he held a variety of management, operations, sales, and marketing roles, and ultimately served as the company's chief executive officer and president, leading a successful effort to strengthen the product line and drive growth. So without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Hurd as he shares his views, insights, and perspectives on the tech industry. So uh, I thought I'd start, because I know we're going to do some Q&A, by starting a little bit with uh, what Oracle does, other than by property. Um, we are, so just to give you some context about our industry and where we compete, we're about a $42, 3000000000 billion company, so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of revenue, and we spend about $5.2 billion in R&D, but let me tell you a little bit more about the industry we're in, what we're going through, and Kenny has given me only eight minutes, so did that count as part of my eight minutes? Uh, thank you, Kenny, I appreciate that. So let me just give you some context. I'm sure you all in the School of Business know this number off the top of your head. Worldwide GDP, 75 trillion. I'm gonna give you the answers. So 75 trillion, IT is only 3% of worldwide GDP. So however big you think IT is, it's only $2 trillion. So I say only, it's a lot of money, but it's only a small percentage of worldwide commerce. So of that two trillion, half is spent by consumers. You know, all of you, you see all the apps you've got, services, devices, et cetera, et cetera. That's one trillion of the two trillion. Companies buy the other trillion. Now I can tell you that if you went back to the history of IT, if you went back just 12 years ago when many of you were, were still in, in, in grade school, you would find that consumer spending was only $200 billion. Consumer spending on IT has gone from $200 billion to a trillion in basically just a decade. Company spending has been roughly the same. It's grown about two or three percent. So the customers, the consumers are investing much faster than the companies can keep up with them. So what's happening in companies today is with only one or two percent growth in IT, they're trying to figure out how to deal with a whole brand new set of employees much like we're hiring lots of people to come into the company, so are other companies, but frankly now, there's three generations, frankly, in some cases, even four generation workers in companies. Retirement age is pushing out towards 70. We have kids coming to the workforce at 21. You've got four generations of workers. This puts lots of strain on IT. And by the way, all of you that are getting jobs when you come out, you're also customers. The new generation of customers are much tougher to deal with for our customers. You all have found ways with services and applications to professionally uh, complain about services, whether it's TripAdvisor, Yelp, et cetera. And so now companies have to deal with all that in near real time to protect their brand, and it requires lots of IT. So it's why you're gonna hear in this industry, you've heard this term cloud. You heard this thing cloud, but it probably doesn't mean much to you. But what it is is basically all of this technology moving from on-premise in data centers off-premise to where people do the work for companies. This is one of the most, the biggest generational shifts in IT that will occur over the next 10 years. This will go from on-premise being a trillion dollars a spend to I'll predict for you 80% of that going into this thing called the cloud. The cloud provided by, whether it's applications, technology, infrastructure provided by companies like, hopefully, like us. And so that's why we spend as much R&D as we do to, to really in, to enable this big shift that's occurring. It's one of the reasons why we're hiring the way we are. We're hiring aggressively, as you could tell by my, this thoughtful introduction. Uh, we've made big investments in facilities in Austin and property in Austin because we're hiring up. And why are we hiring? To facilitate the engineering required and the enablement of that engineering through sales to be able to realize this vision of the movement of this technology away from everybody doing it themselves. So let me just give you one example. Pick a big company, any Fortune 50 company you want to, AT&T, Boeing, General Electric, et cetera. Today they hire tens of, in some cases, tens of thousands of people to produce IT on their own premise, write their own software, integrate their own piece parts into a solution. This cloud thing is 
moving that from you doing the work and shifting the work to somebody else and freeing up lots of capital to invest in other things, like how to find more customers, how to be able to make my, give my employees better productivity tools so they can innovate and, if you will, chase that consumer that I told you about who's innovating quicker than these companies can keep up. This is the opportunity for companies to save money and innovate faster at the same time. And so in a short period of eight minutes, that's sort of <laughs> what's going on in the industry and why there's so much rivalry now. And you're going to see billions of market capitalization move from old technology companies to the people that can affect this cloud transition. Billions and billions of dollars, millions of jobs will move from the old technology companies to the new technology companies as part of this process. So it's a big change, and it's why we're investing the way we are, hiring the way we are. And I'll stop there, and we'll do whatever questions you'd like. Okay? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hurd, for that wonderful insight. We'll now be moving on to our usual interview segment. Take it away, Dean Platt. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. Thank you, Mark, for being here. My pleasure. Glad we could arrange such a, a stellar introduction for you. This oh, welcome. It's motivated. I, I, it's high energy. It's, it's, it's. <laughs> I, I feel compelled to ask a little about the project now. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in Austin, what that campus is about? Yeah, sure. Um, so the way we think about get it because of this thing called cloud, mm -hmm. we're able to do now, I told you about GE and Boeing, some of these big companies. We can now do for a small company what we did for a big company. This is really pretty cool because mm -hmm. now we get a chance to move, if you will, down market. And it's caused us to sell differently than we used to. We sell a lot more uh, via technology. We sell via the telephone. We, see, we demonstrate capabilities via the network. And so we're building these large hubs of capability where you know, we can uh, bring people, give them incredible infrastructure so they can demonstrate, sell, represent our technology. Mm -hmm. And of those four big hubs, one of those four is Austin. Good. And so the, the area we picked out, which is right on the river, um, is designed to be the most modern, exciting sort of workplace in the IT industry to affect the ability to do what I just said. Good. And you were telling me earlier about the, um, the housing angle of this, which I thought was very interesting, unlike yeah, the housing I mean, angle they were asking about. Yeah, but. I know they're not happy, but yeah. uh, you know, it, it, as part of it, we bought a, uh, a housing complex. It's not what they're talking about, but the, the, a new one that was just built. Mm -hmm. And our objective is because when kids come out of school, they often have a hard time you know, getting started. They get that first paycheck and they may have more bills when they get started. And so providing them with at least some capacity to have housing, we think is a big incentive and a big asset so that we can get problems off their back, to be very frank, so they can focus more on work mm -hmm. and, and get started. So it's just, we think, a benefit to be able to give them some short-term housing so they have the opportunity to, to focus on, on their training and their enablement as they move forward in their career. That's great. Well, a lot of the folks here are looking at uh, their first jobs, or their first full-time jobs, anyway, in the not-too-distant future. Can you tell us a little bit about yours? Yeah, sure. I, I, uh, I got out of uh, school uh, 100 miles north of here, and I was... Uh, athlete in college and, and you know, I, I focused on that. Uh, when I was in school, I graduated with a degree in business, came mm -hmm. out of business school and I looked for a job and to be very blunt with you, I, I took a job with, uh, with uh, IBM. Um, and before I graduated, uh, I was gonna work here in Austin, which I thought was great. I was gonna sell big computers. So I was very motivated because I wanted to be in the tech sector. And they gave, in those days, they gave you a signing bonus. So you got a check. So this was really interesting to me. So I got a check and a signing bonus. And then before I started, they sent me a letter that moved me to Midland. And in there, they moved my division so I'd be selling typewriters. So this was not my idea of where I wanted to go or what I want. I love Midland. I mean, so I'm, but I just didn't want to work there when I, was eight, when I was 21. And so the only people left on campus to interview were NCR. So I took a job with NCR in San Antonio, selling big computers, and that was my first job, was selling computers to customers in San Antonio, Texas. Hmm, interesting. So you've, you've obviously traveled a long path between there and here. How, did, how does that happen? How does a person go from starting off selling, almost selling typewriters, and then moving to NCR, and then getting to where you are now? Well, I didn't look at it the way you described it. So okay. I, I didn't think of it like, hey, I'm going to go do this. I thought about it sort of one job at a time. I mean, I took every job, and my, my view was I was going to go do my job and do the best I could at yeah. it. And, and then 
my view would be every time you did a job well, somebody would say, hey, if you can do that well, maybe you can do the next thing well. And I didn't have some uh, scheme or plan or model that said, I'm gonna go be CEO of the company. My view was just to you know, get the opportunity to do more and just deliver in the job I was in, and, and that's, what I, that's what I focused on. No doubt along the way you had some, some challenges, everybody does. When you've encountered failures, how, how do you get around that and get back up from it and move on? So I think that's tough. I think that uh, one thing I'll say that is the higher you get in a company, the more criticism uh, you get. And it's just like with any poll that you see when, you know, the favorability poll, it's great when a president has a 51% favorability rating. I mean, by definition, 49% of the people say no. And, and I think the more decisions you make, the more people you upset. And, and so as, as a result, I think if you want to go do bigger and bigger jobs, you know, you have to be prepared for it because I, I could, I know you know this, Dean, when you, as, as in the school business, but when you're in big jobs, the investors and most people, they don't really care about your problems, right? I mean, they care about their problems. And so the higher you go in these companies, the more you just have to focus on, and, and focus on the right things and stay focused on them and try very hard not to let the distractions become distractions. Yeah, yeah. Is there, is there something you haven't done or something you haven't mastered yet in your career that you'd like to move to next? Well, I'm more at the, uh, at the end. My wife is here. She's, uh, by the way, a proud graduate of UT. And um, by the way, I, uh, uh, it, it, it's a source of a, tri a little bit of conflict every now and then when better than two play. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think so much that I'm, given where I am in my career, the opportunity I described to you um, a little while earlier is a generate, you know, you don't get many shots. I won't get another shot like the one we have in front of us at Oracle today. Mm -hmm. And so my, uh, con what consumes me is the execution of the strategy that, that I just described. Yeah, okay, so, so it, I guess that strategy is how you're trying to set yourself apart at Oracle, right? What are, the, what are the biggest challenges you confront in that? Well, we change everything in the company. So the, the problem at Oracle, when you're, you're running Oracle as a company, this is, by the way, if you go to a company, like when I left and came to HP, HP was in real trouble. When I came, it was all about break up the company. This company is strategically flawed. It can't, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, that's actually an easier leadership job. When you come in and you stand in front of a group of people and everybody thinks the ship is sinking and you say, we're going here. People say, thank goodness we're going somewhere. And, and, and people follow. It's actually harder when you're running a company that's doing well. And you actually say, listen, we got to go over here because there's going to be a change. And everybody says, I, I don't know what you mean, we're doing pretty good. Stock's doing pretty good, we're gaining share, we're winning. What, is it you mean, what do you mean we have to change? And so that's actually you know, a tougher leadership. And in the context of that, we've changed our engineering, we've changed, as I mentioned to you, our sales approach. Mm -hmm. We're adding, we've doubled our sales force, doubled it in the last four years, doubled it. We've increased our R&D 1.3 billion, we've taken our R&D from 3.7 billion to 5.1, 5.2 billion just in that time frame. We've changed how we develop, we've changed how we engineer. This cloud delivery is actually a very big change in how we deliver technology. So there really isn't anything in the company we haven't touched over the course of the last four years to affect this change that, that I described. Uh, I almost hate then to ask you about more change, but I'm sure part of your job as CEO is to, is to always be looking out at the future and say, what's the next big disruptor, especially in a tech company? So how do you think about that, and what do you think the next big disruptor might be? Well, I think, the, first of all, this, this disruptor I described is, is probably a decade-long uh, process. Now, it'll, 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 it'll have in the next five years pretty rapid, I think, uh, adoption, but we're still in the very you know, early stages of this disruption. If I were to tell you the next big thing I think you'll see in tech capability, it'll be that device you've got right there. Mm -hmm. I think people will be taking uh, pictures of us with fingers pushing on pieces of glass and think back and look back and think we're, we're all sort of uh, cave people. Um, and so I think the user interface itself, the ability to interact with data, with technology will change dramatically over the course of the next five, six, seven years, sort of point one, point two. I think the integration of that data, meaning the ability to get from you know, a, a simple piece of data to two or three questions out in that enterprise data will get infinitely easier. 
I think those changes combined with the cloud capability will, will revolutionize the way you know, our customers do business uh, dramatically. Shift gears a little bit, who, who do you admire the most? Well, most of the people that I really ad, ad, admire, you know, when you think of it that way, are probably dead. I mean, you know, it's most of the, the people I look back on are the people that had an idea, who at the time they had the idea, the idea was ridiculous. And, and it became reality. I mean, I think of things like the people, that, the, the, the fathers of this country, you know, when you think of George, the idea, we're going to create a new country. The idea, can you imagine doing this revolu you know, against the king? I just, it's hard to imagine at the time what was going through that process to what we take commonly. So people that have done, and by the way, I, I put in that category somebody who's not, I mean, the, the guy who founded our company, Larry Ellison, I mean, he had an idea. He had an idea that wasn't popular. He had no money. He drove a car mm -hmm. from Chicago to, to, to the Silicon Valley, had no money, started programming. Now you have Oracle. So people that... You know, people that take things, in my opinion, that, that, that you know, nobody else thinks is possible. I mean, the art of the possible and the achievement of that is what I admire most. Okay. What's the best piece of advice you were ever given? Well, I, you know, I had the benefit of um, having fantastic bosses and fantastic. By the way, I would tell you this, that, you know, whatever you do when you decide to come out of school, you know, while companies will be making decisions about you, remember, you're making a decision about the company at the same time. And, and really, the most important decision you'll make isn't just the company, but who you're working for. Because almost all the time when you work for a company, you will see that entire company through the lens of your manager. And so whoever that manager is, is a huge thing for you. And by the way, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but not all managers are great. <laughs> the managers that are willing to give of themselves, the managers that are willing to share you know, insight and mentor you are few and far between. So I hate to say pick your boss wisely. Try hard to understand who that boss is because I had the benefit when you say advice. I, don't, I can't think of one piece of advice. I can think of tons of advice I got. Mm -hmm. And I was taught early when I was at NCR to not worry about what you asked me earlier. Okay. Don't worry about being CEO. Mm -hmm. Worry about doing as many jobs as you can so that if you ever become CEO, when you're in the meeting with a bunch of people, you've done as many of their jobs as possible. So that when I sit in the room and somebody says, well, let me tell you about that, and I can say, you know, I've done your job. And if I can do as many of those jobs as possible, my preparation uh, is extreme. So that, that advice was very helpful to me because I think there are a lot of people whose view is, I just want to move hierarchically as fast as I possibly can. And, and, and you'll have to trust me on this. It's probably easier to say from the seat I'm in today. But the opportunity to do many things and to get as broad a set of experiences as possible with great bosses, I mean, that's a career panacea. Yeah. So as you're looking at individuals, say somebody that, that you're supervising, what are the characteristics that you look for? What makes someone stand out to you as being somebody you want to promote? Well, I mean, to be very, be very blunt, first of all, it's hard to coach smart. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so you know, obviously, I, you know, obviously, I'll say one thing about, about who I try to surround myself with. There are two kinds of leaders, and there are leaders, and again, I, I want to focus on the negative, but there are leaders whose view it is to surround themselves with people that can't replace them. I'm going to make sure that my board when they see the people that work for me say, oh, that guy can't replace Mark, so we better keep Mark. Um, I think that's actually a very bad strategy. I think the strategy is surround yourself with the best people you possibly can. Get the best talent you possibly can. Those that are honest, and honest is a big deal. When I say honest, I don't mean honest just in terms of not like, but honest in terms of their dialogue with you. That when you're wrong, they have the courage to say, hey, can we talk about that again? Think about that again so that you actually have a lot of opinions that you've got honest, they're diverse in their experience, that they're not exactly like you, that they have a hard, they have a strong work ethic and they have great leadership. It's very important for me to have people that have strong leadership capabilities that can inspire large groups of people to take a hill. 
So those are the characteristics I'm looking for uh, in, in people that, that certainly report to me. Okay. What's a, an event in, in your life that has helped to define written, your Have character? you written out all these questions? Oh, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm ready. Okay. Ahead, these, I'm these, I, I don't take credit. These guys did it for me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fire away. Sorry. Oh, so, so is there a moment or event that, that defines for you, you know, what that you think became, helped become the core of your character? Well, listen, I think you always have moments that you don't hear about. I mean, listen, the average CEO, if you don't know this, lasts about four and a half years. So it's a very short, it's not a two-term president on average. <laughs> so it's, you sort of get one term on average. Now, I've, I don't know, I'm a, I've been a CEO about like 14 years, 13 years now. So if it's cumulative, I'm done, right? I mean, but it's, it's per job, it's about four and a half years. So you've got a very limited amount of time. And, and trust me on this, most CEOs stare at the, the problem. And it is a character defining moment when there's nobody there except you when you get in these jobs. I have a fortunate thing in that we have a team, you know, at, at Oracle, and it isn't just me. Most cases, it's just you. And, and every day is a character defining moment because every decision, back to the point of this earlier thing, right? Every decision you make affects lives. You know, we have 140,000 people in our company and almost every decision I make affects lives. You know, if we decide to change an organization, we decide to reduce a workforce, every one of those decisions affects families and lives and those are all you know, character building moments for you. And, and listen, when you're, I remember the day I took over NCR and we had not had a good run. There was a reason, there's always a reason why you get these jobs. Yep. And not all mm -hmm. these reasons are always good. Most, many times the people before you had a real tough time. And I'd worked at NCR 23 years. And when I finally became uh, president, actually when I didn't become CEO, because when I became president, I was running almost the entire company. And I remember coming home and telling my wife when I came home, I'm not sure I can fix this. I, I'm not sure. Here we got 35,000 employees, 35,000 jobs, and these are, when you sit there by yourself and saying, I've got a limited amount of time to get this turned, to make payroll, to be able to get the business healthy, you know, those, those test your, yeah. they test your character. When you, um, we, 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 we hear a lot about ethics, and we talk a lot about ethics in the business school, and sometimes it feels hard to make it real, in a sense. Um, and I know that's the job, you know, the tone at the top. That's the, that's the job of a CEO is to make a, an ethical organization and to communicate that down through the organization. How do you do that? Well, we do a lot through education, but I, I will tell you that it's particularly hard in a global company. Hmm. So when you get into a global company, what we think is important here and how we're brought up in this country isn't necessarily the way people are brought up in other countries. And so it's very hard to get through to people that if you go to... You know, if you go to China, you go to India, I mean, the practices, the mores, the beliefs are not necessarily exactly what we think is, is something that's wrong, isn't necessarily wrong as, as some of those people are brought up. And so the ability to communicate in a broad way, like for example, you know, you go to some countries, you, we, we think a lot about foreign corrupt, FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Acts here, which is basically uh, an American company doing bad things in a foreign country that, that, that would allow it to get business. Now, when I go to some countries, the thought of bribing somebody, which is completely foreign and unethical to a U.S. company, is sort of how they're brought up. That as I get higher in a company, I'm used to accepting favors. That's part of my uh, ascendancy to the top of an organization. So when you start to educate people in those environments and say, no, 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 that's not how it works. We don't do that. that that takes work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes work. And so we have to do a lot of training. We do a lot of work to try to make sure people understand what you can't do, what you can do. We test to it. We actually measure it. Um, we have the whole company signing things that, that, and all, so we do all sort of what you would think of as the perfunctory things. But to your point, I can't, back to this point about managers, I can't legislate that. That has to be the way we live, the way we work, and our employees see things through their manager's eyes. So we have to train those managers on that we want to win, and trust me, we want to win badly. But we want to win badly the right way. Yeah, yeah. So let me just wrap up with one last question. Um, you know, what, what makes your job really great? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Winning. I mean, you know, listen, <laughs> I mean, we got a chance. We have a chance. 
<laughs> in, in this, we have a lot of competitive companies. I'm sure you have the opportunity to interview with. I would never publicly mention any of their names because that are, that are really in deep trouble. I mean, I wouldn't say that IBM's in deep trouble. Uh, I wouldn't say SAP's in deep trouble. I wouldn't say any of those. These are big companies that aren't going to make it to the other side. We have a guy, by the way, I'll tell you funny, we have a guy on our board, uh, Leon Panetta, who was the Secretary of Defense at the CIA, and Larry Ellison, who's our founder, and I were having a conversation about the future of IBM. And I actually, we were actually talking about we think they've got a real tough time, as you've seen over the past couple of years. And I remember Leon uh, looking over and goes, are you talking about IBM? And we're like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, that's the greatest company in the history of America. <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 that's it. And he says, you don't think they're going to make it to the other side? No. So these are huge, these are huge changes that are coming. And the opportunity to not only be part of it, mm -hmm. but to then win and to enable this company to be uh, at the front of that. And we, I, there's certain words I can't use. I'll just say that we become a really popular company, mm -hmm. uh, more popular as we do it. Um, that motivates uh, the heck out of me. And doing it, I would also argue to you, with a group of people I like to work with, yeah. is because uh, in the end of this, this has to be fun. So doing yeah. it with people and having fun is a big deal. That's great. Great. Well, I've had my share of time. Um, we've got some microphones. I guess we have one microphone here right in the center. And if you have a question uh, for Mr. Hurd, please just come on up and make a line at the microphone, and um, we'll take you in turn. Hello. Hey, Hi. Mark. How you doing, Mark? Great. Good. So, I mean, you being, you know, CEO of a couple of big companies, the last two you've been, uh, you know, top Fortune 10 tech companies, HP and Oracle. Uh, I mean, right now, you know, as an executive, you make huge decisions, you know, especially in tech. Where is the puck going? Not where it is, you know, moving from cloud. Uh, as an executive, being a co-CEO, how is it being... Uh, to make decisions with another individual, Safra Katz, in this, in this case. And, and it's great. So let me tell you, the, the thing I would say uh, about these jobs is that, as I mentioned earlier, they're hard. And I know it doesn't seem that way when you always say, oh, I wish I can't be, I, I want to be one of those guys. It's probably easy to just tell people what to do and it all gets done. It's not the way it works. I mean, this is hard, hard stuff. And so if you get lucky enough to have people you like to work with, that can help you get that done. It is an unbelievable asset. Embrace it, grab it. You know, it, now Safra and I, I get that question a lot about the two of us, but it's more than us, right? I mean, Larry Ellison is still active. He's very active and he's, he's fantastic. I'm telling you, he's a generational, he thinks the way you describe, he thinks generationally, not just where the puck is going, but where the next rink is. And so the ability to have that sort of team, and I, I don't have enough time to tell you the talent we have inside the company. This is my point to you, build teams, get surrounded with the best people, the smartest people that can help you achieve your objectives. It's, uh, it's the best blessing you can get, because I tell you, I've also done the job when you're alone, and I'm telling you, you're alone. Yeah, thanks. Hello, Mr. Hurd. Uh, my name is Tomas D'Amico. I'm a computer science major here at UT. And I have two questions for you, and they're kind of different scopes. So the first one was, how are you bringing third world countries into the developed world when it comes to computing systems and operating systems and whatnot? And the second question is, since we're moving more towards a cloud-based technology and you're saying that we're going to store most of our knowledge there, I was wondering if we're going to move away from having all of our storage on a personal computer and we're having a cloud-based computer so it would make our personal computers more efficiency based on the time-space trade-off of running programs on your computer. Uh, okay, let me take the second one first. Um, so on the second one, I, I think you're going to see storage, because of its efficiency, moving more and more to the cloud. Now there's a security implication. You didn't ask about that, but so I won't I won't cover it. But in terms of uh, in terms of your question, I think you'll see more and more storage moved to the cloud, both from companies uh, as well as from individuals. I think there'll be a lot of evolution about the security of that, et cetera, et cetera. It's in the news again yet today, uh, but that's where I think uh, it'll have, it's just too, it's not just a technology decision, it's also an economic uh, decision that will occur as well. So in yeah. third, you want me to take your second one or did you have some, something else you want to say? Uh, yeah, what I was focusing more on was the aspect of making our computers more efficient. If, it's, if it, we're going to use cloud-based technology to try to maximize runtime and make our computers and our, our, like for the businesses more efficient by storing in a completely different place from where we process. In terms of raw performance and speed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I, I, I think there'll always be the issue of this 
technical thing about latency, you know, that exists between space. But in the end, you're going to wind up in your hand with more processing power, not less. I think you will have less data storage and you will be going to the network to get that data. But you will have, once you get that data, extreme processing power in a very small footprint in your hand. That's where I think this will head. Okay, so you're saying that like we can have a phone and it can have much more processing power than we're capable of now. Let's give you an example. Access. This device Cloud that, that Dean has here. Remember, I told you when I got yeah. out of school um, that I was going to sell big 360 mainframes from IBM 1980. Yes. This is about twice as powerful as a 360. Okay. It's, it's, so it's shocking what what's happened, and this will do yeah. nothing but get more powerful as 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 time goes on, as well as it's all shrink in footprint. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. By the last one on third world countries. The cloud gives you a whole new opportunity because the biggest problem in third world countries is the access to infrastructure. Lack of networks, lack of money to invest in infrastructure. The cloud allows you to skip that whole investment of capital. So the opportunity now, as long as you can get network capability and tie into the network, I can get access to programming language, operating systems, virtual machines, all sorts of capabilities that otherwise I couldn't afford to bring. So if I'm, if I'm sitting in, in the middle of Africa, I get the opportunity now if I can get on a network, and get these, which is not the easiest thing in Africa, but if I can, I get access to all the technology you can in an Oracle lab. So this is going to okay. be the best thing in the world for the development of infrastructure. So you're just saying ease of access for, for people who... Ease of access to the best stuff with very little capital investment. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Monish. I'm a senior here. Um, my question really talks about, at the beginning of our conversation, you talked a lot about how the company is changing, more R&D, more sales. Um, so it's been culture change almost. Um, over the last couple of years, Oracle's invested a lot in acquisitions, um, I think at nine to 10 a year. Um, how is that M&A strategy going to change as the company culture also changes the coming, in the coming years? Well, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, so we actually do both. When I tell you about our 5.2 billion of R&D, I understate our innovation because our innovation really is that R&D plus what we buy in through an acquisition because those acquisitions have all spent money on innovation. And acquisitions, to your point, are hard. Um, it's hard because each of those companies has their own culture. They've got their own way of doing things. And I'm, I'm sure it's hard for you to believe it at Oracle. We actually have our own way of doing things. And so the ability to blend those together becomes a leadership challenge. Uh, what we do, to tell you that uh, how we do it, is we have a very standard way of integrating all of what you would think of as the back office functions. One way to process orders, one way to do a contract, et cetera, et cetera. We let the R&D teams continue to feature string and build their own products. We very rarely mess with the R&D teams. We let them focus on what they did best. There's a reason we bought them, and it's usually because they have great technology, and it's usually because they have great salespeople. So what we do is really take out whatever we don't need, standardize the back end, leave the sales teams and the engineering teams, and then we use the strategy of, 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 of working very hard on trying to integrate them to the Oracle culture the best we can while not affecting the core engine that created the value in the first place. Got it. Yeah. And does that always work? Uh, how do does it always work? No. <laughs> I know, I know. No. I, I, I knew mean, the answer was no. I, no, like, I mean, you know, listen, I mean, I get, I get CEOs all the time that have companies we bought that tell me, I can't wait to come to Oracle. And I can't, I tell you how many times I tell them, you really don't want to come. Because you, you're used to running a company that's XYZ size and you're used to being in charge. You're used to doing things the way you want. And the only thing I can tell you is, at Oracle, I'm in charge. And, and so we have, a, I mean, I, I, we, could, we, could, we could talk past each other, but in fairness, and we have a certain, and Safra's in charge, we have a certain way that we do things and that's not gonna change. So, what we really try to do is focus on those two things. Keep that core sales engine together because it's, it's a reason we, again, we don't buy crummy companies. Okay. So we don't buy companies just to strip them and fire people and get cash flow. Some companies do that, we don't. We buy companies typically because they're the best. They're the leader at what they do. They have leading technology, leading engineers, and leading sales forces. And we actually pay a lot of money. We're not afraid to pay up to get a great company. And we've done that. And so for us, we have to protect those assets. And those assets are typically the IP, the technology, and the people. And it's the people in the R&D organization and the people in the sales organization that we hold here, and that's what we focus on. And does it always work? No, but it does most of the time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, sir, my name's Austin. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that uh, what motivates you to get up in the morning is winning, and I was just curious, 
What's your metric for winning? Is it stock price, earnings, market share, or some combination? Cash flow. Cash flow. All those things you said, you betcha, you got them. I mean, that's how it goes. I mean, it goes by revenue, you know, cash flow, market share, stock price, all the above, employee satisfaction, uh, customer satisfaction, all those metrics. And by the way, I think you're going to find one thing that all of those metrics you describe, well, you might say, gee, that's a list of things. They all work together. You show me happy employees, I'll show you in the end, happy customers. You show me happy customers, I'll tell you, we're get, they're buying more from you. You're growing, you're gaining market share, your earnings are increasing. So it's all sort of one continuum, but yeah, I love all those metrics you mentioned. They're all great. All right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jacob Salazar. I am a PhD student for this year in uh, computational engineering and sciences. Uh, my question is um, related to big old liars. I, I think it's pretty clear you're quite an old liar. Uh, one of the main thesis of Michael uh, Gladwell in his book of liars is that apart from, apart from a lot of work and geniality, greater liars make it in part to outstanding resources which are not always available for everybody, such as connections, education, stuff like that. Would you say in your case, apart from great bosses that you said you had, uh, you served from any other resources? And if so, uh, you think it's, is it really necessary? And how to override that need uh, for those who don't currently yeah. have them? Well, it's a hard question what you ask. Um, because I'm only, I can only deal with my own experience and then I have, to, I have to, to speculate a bit because I agree with the view. I was lucky to have an amazing amount of resources. Uh, even though I might not think of them as my resources, I was able to leverage. I went to a, I went to a great school where I had great professors who really helped me and I was surrounded by a lot of, of support. I got to go to a company early that invested in me. I went to this company and I got eight months of training before I started. Before I started working, I got eight months of training as part of the, these are just amazing things that at the time, to your point, I didn't think, hey, this is amazing. I thought this was just the way it is. And, and to your point, it's, it's very interesting because we recruit, remember I told you about how we recruit in the United States, we'll recruit how many kids this year, Amanda? Probably 1,500 in the U.S., probably, you know, three, probably 1,800 out of the U.S., including engineers. We do that all around the world. That's just U.S., so we do that all around the world. And I think it's part of our job, our Oracle's job, to try to bring those resources. That's why we invest in education the way we do, to try to bring at least the part we can affect to as many people as possible. And by the way, I'll give another pitch yet for the cloud again. I think this is one of the great promises of what the new sets of technology will do. We'll bring resources and capability to places we never could have 10 years ago by just being able to affect technology that's fantastic at a materially lower price than we ever could have before. Okay, okay, and well, well once I'm on it, do you think it, it would pay off for you as a company uh, to look for talent in uh, other places uh, where their uh, wages are not as high as in the U.S. Do, do companies really look forward to that? No. Uh, so let me, let me try to go back one more time because I, I understood the point. Man. People have tried to convince me for years that if we could get two cheap engineers over here, it's more effective than getting one more expensive engineer over here. And I'm like, stop talking. This is just not a good idea. I just want the best engineer. I don't really care about how cheap the engineer is. Give me the best engineer. One great guy is better than however many it is that can't do anything. So I, this is not all about money. It's about capability. So you want to obviously have the best people you can at the lowest cost. So I don't get me wrong, I don't want to overpay. <laughs> but I can't afford to have the worst people at the lowest cost. I want to have the best people at the lowest cost. So this ability to arbitrage labor it's not, in my opinion, uh, a brilliant strategy. It's still all about, in the end, just remember this, you want the best people working for you. You want the best people. And if it costs you a little more to do it, do it. 
Okay, great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I want to help companies start entrepreneurship programs, which is basically taking entrepreneurship principles and putting them in a large corporation because I think it has a lot of benefits. Do you have experience with these programs and what are your thoughts on the concept in general? Well, you know, we try to keep entrepreneurship is an interesting word in its raw sense that I start a company with no, no capital, uh, no money whatsoever. We don't do that because we have the benefit of having a lot of capital. I didn't check this morning, but my guess is we have, you know, 52, $3 billion worth of cash as a company. So we have a lot of assets and a lot of capability. What we would like to do, though, is to affect taking great ideas and fostering innovation, but capitalizing those ideas to give people the opportunity to flourish. So that's different than entrepreneurship in its truest form. We're not starved for capital. Part of the biggest issue when you're an entrepreneur is spending time raising capital. We've already skipped that part. We have the capital. So our job is to foster innovation, incubate, and so do we, what we do do is we take ideas and we incubate them. So for example, remember I told you about the R&D being 5.2 billion? About 5% of our R&D is actually R. When most people tell you about R&D, it's mostly D. We actually spend money in the R. And the R is what I just said. It is an idea that isn't a roadmap, but it, on a roadmap, it's not a product, it's an idea. But you have to give people uh, an opportunity to go make that idea flourish. It could take two, three, four, five years to come to fruition. But what we do do is we capitalize it. We give them capital. So it isn't as pure as the entrepreneurial model, but it's sort of in between where we really, because all we're interested in is innovation. We need new ideas and we got to get these people free form to be able to think uh, out of the box. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Oh no, more than one question? Oh, never mind. Whatever Kenny Keegan says. Coming. Right? <laughs> Hello, sir. My name's Keegan Bradley. And uh, just sort of a broad question. Um, something we hear a lot about as students is the culture of Oracle and um, why it's such a great place to work because of the people that are there. And I was just hoping you could speak to what is that culture of Oracle that makes it such a great place to work? Well, I hope it, you know, I mean, that's certainly our objective is to make it a great place to work. I, I believe that. You know, it's, it's funny, I get all these studies from our HR department about millennials, which I always find interesting. They put me in a room and they show me these charts and we've done all these surveys, I guess, that's great. So, and they tell me, you know, millennials don't want to be in a job more than three years. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, well, is this like a revelation to you? So I'm like, I didn't want to be in a job more than three years. I was with a company 25 years, I didn't have the same job more than three years, I was moved into lots of different jobs really quick. I was just done within the same company. And so I think that we need to provide, I think we have an amazing opportunity to provide a career where you can have 20 jobs over the course of 35 years and never get bored. We operate in 82 countries. We do everything from consulting to engineering to product management to marketing to sales. You know, and we do it in multiple different ways in multiple different disciplines. And so what is hard is to make sure that gets enabled, that everybody in the company is on the same page and in nurturing people through. Now within that, we are a performance-oriented culture. So just to be clear about Oracle, if you have interest in Oracle as a company, we're not a, um, you know, a, a communistic, socialistic sort of company, like, hey, it's all okay. We want people to show up and do work. We're a get things done kind of company. And it, it, it sources from, frankly, our founder. Uh, you know, our founder is a get things done kind of guy. And we have get things done kind of people running the company. And so our job is to get a get things done company, a performance oriented culture, and within the context of that culture, to drive the opportunity to let people that do perform flourish. Flourish from a career pathing perspective and be able to do more. I don't think Oracle's for everybody by the way. I think Oracle is for the people that can fit in, in, in that kind of environment and flourish. And don't get me wrong, not everything's perfect. You know, you can check with all the people from UT that have come to work. Not everything's perfect, because we're going through, as, as Dean said, a lot of changes in this transition. But I do think, you know, it's a company on offense, not defense. And a company that's going to where earlier said where the puck is headed as opposed to where it's been. And I think it's an exciting place to work, and our job is to keep making it exciting. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hey, thanks for coming out to the 40 Acres, Mark. Uh, my name is Kenneth Spryer. I'm a senior economics and public policy major. Um, on behalf of all the students at the University of Texas, I'd like to apologize for the disturbance that occurred prior to the lecture. Um, I also have a question about cloud sales um, and how crucial the current pricing strategy is for cloud solutions. And do you foresee that changing as more and more companies uh, move towards the cloud? Yeah. I, I think that uh, cloud is infinitely cheaper for customers because customers today um, spend everything to build it themselves. And so the part of the problem you have with cloud pricing today is it's simply compared to a fixed infrastructure on premise, data centers and servers and all of the stuff that's there today. And so in many cases, the beginning of cloud is looked at as an incremental spend as opposed to a replacement spend. That you will see starting to change. So as you start to see that movement of change, I, this is a guess for you, but that the price to, when you move to the cloud, you'll see if you took the current environment and repriced it all in the cloud, my guess is you'd see about 30% lower cost in totality. Now, with every generation of computing, mainframe computing, to client server computing, to the internet, now to cloud, the market grows because the thirst for data Data, if you don't know, data on the planet doubles every couple years. So the set of data set will be, twi by 2020, we'll have 10x the amount of growth in data. So IT will be bigger, but if I just repriced today's environment in the cloud, my guess is roughly 30% less. Now what'll happen by 2020 is that 30% less will grow to be bigger because there'll be more data, more workloads, et cetera, et cetera, but it's definitely cheaper to move to the cloud. Appreciate it, Mark. Thank you, sir. Hello, Mark. Uh, I don't know if you need a breather by now because you've answered so many questions. Oh, I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I guess I'm the Cups second last question. Uh, so my question is, uh, since Austin is such a great city for startups and um, up-and-coming companies, um, as a CEO and with prior years of experience, uh, what would you recommend uh, that it takes for a, a new and upcoming leader, a CEO, to become a CEO or to start their own company? Is it, are they born? technically is like an innate behavior or can anyone, or not necessarily anyone, but can, is it worth taking the risk of becoming your own boss? I, listen, I think that's a personal decision. I mean, there's people that want to go to work inside uh, bigger companies and there's people that like the, the opportunity afforded by taking a chance. And usually entrepreneurs and companies that eventually get to scale, and scale, to, we can argue about what scale is, but a company that at least has some revenue, several million dollars uh, uh, plus, it all starts with an idea. And, and then the next question after you get to the idea is the idea, op, you know, can you operationalize the idea? Can I actually get to the idea and make the idea come to fruition? And, and then can I eventually capitalize the idea? And, and, and so that's the key to any process. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, remember that, you know, there, the number of startups in the Silicon Valley, uh, when you go look at them, remember a majority of them fail. So it, it always, I always get the pressure, oh, I'll go to Silicon Valley, I'm going to drive out there in my car and I'll make a couple billion dollars, you know, after I take this idea. It's not the way it works. 90%, 92%, 93% of those companies fall apart after less than a year. It's only 8% make it to year two. Right. So then you get, I think it halves again when you get to year three, halves again, when, or year two, and you have years again when you get to year three. So you're talking about, of all those ideas, at the end of the day, you're talking about one, two percent get to the other side. So I think it's about, you know, do you want to take that risk? Now, clearly, if you if you you can see many people in our industry, whether it's whether it's Ellison, whether it's Jobs, whether it's Zuckerberg, you can find many people that have said, I've got an idea and I'm willing to take the risk to make it work and it's work. For every one of those guys that I just described, there's hundreds that didn't. So it's just it's just one of those decisions you got to make. Now I will say this for big companies, since I'm running a big company. One of, I think, the big assets in a company like Oracle is that even if you want to be an entrepreneur, the lessons you can learn in these big companies and the disciplines you can learn are something you just, you can't learn them in school. As hard as the faculty here will try to prepare you, they can't. They can't. They can't give you the real life experience of facing the real life, real time problems in these companies and learning what the, the, comp the sophisticated, and I'll, I'll put us in the league of that. Um, it's just, it's a fantastic lesson. Even if you decide later to go take a big idea, remember uh, salesforce.com, not a company I like. 
Um, but the guy who founded it worked at Oracle for 10, 12 years, had an idea, took those lessons from Oracle and applied them. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. It. Now we're back to the last question, so it's yours. Hi, my name is Samantha Shea. I'm about to graduate with a degree in marketing and I'll be joining Oracle sales team in July. Um, oh, congratulations. Thank you. I'm very excited <laughs> welcome. <about it. laughs> um, so my question has to do more with the people aspect of working at Oracle. Um, I'm taking a positive psychology class right now, and it really emphasizes how happy employees increase productivity and efficiency within mm -hmm. a company. So my question is about how you place a focus on employee sentiment. Well, listen, employees, the number one driver of employee satisfaction, employee delight at the end of the day is, and I hate to go back to this one core word, is winning. It's very tough when employees don't win or feel like they're winning and contributing to get people happy. The number one driver of employee satisfaction, in spite of whatever somebody tells you, is not pay. Pay comes down fourth or fifth on the list. What comes down number one is, do I feel like I'm winning? Do I feel like I'm part of an environment where I'm learning and gaining? Three, do I really like my manager? Does my manager mentor me, help me, and do I learn from the manager? Those three core fundamentals are what drive employee delight. And, that's, and then, of course, do I get paid for doing that in a, in a favorable way? But if you don't have the first three right, I'm not winning. I don't like this environment because nobody really helps me and my manager's terrible. I can't pay you enough to stay. So at the end of the day, those are the core fundamentals we follow. And I'm not here to tell you, you'll find this out. We're not perfect at everything. We're working hard to get better at every single one of these dimensions as we go forward, but those are the keys that we, that we focus on. By the way, one thing you're gonna find quickly when you join Oracle, we're gonna train you. We're gonna spend the money, and it's gonna seem like, I'm actually one of, the, not everybody at Oracle actually does everything I say, which I find to be a, a real problem, but, but I can tell you that, for example, I actually think we should have more training. I can't tell you how many people that join, because I, I bring all the people that come to school through my house, and I, I talk to them as they come through, and all of them want to get out of training faster. And I, I, if there's any cut, don't rush. You know, don't rush. I want to do more training to Oracle, not, not less, because I want you more prepared. When you get to the moment of truth, I want you more prepared, not, not less prepared. So I hope you have a fantastic experience, and uh, congratulations on, on joining the company. Thank you. I look Thank forward you. to coming to your house. Yeah, <laughs> see you there. See you there. <laughs>